Hi everyone, my name is Sujin and I serve as the Youth Ministry Director here at Christ Central. Um, and so if you are watching this video, it means you've signed up for a Christ Central Institute, a CCI class, um, probably a, about one of the Bible study classes, and you've been asked to watch this video just in preparation for the class. And so this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about how do we do a personal study of the Bible. Um, and you know, this is just kind of one way of looking at Bible um, personal personal worship and how you can tackle passages on your own. Everyone kind of has something that works for them. Um, but this is just given to you as an example of one way that you can do it that I think is helpful for us to be more intentional when we study passages. Um, and in your class, you will be asked to, um, you know, in between class times, you will be asked to go through passages on your own and kind of wrestle with it um, and in, try to interpret it on your own. And so um, if you don't have anything that works for you, I do think this is helpful to practice. And so so um, yeah, I, I hope this is something that you can try out for your own time of personal worship. Um, and so one thing that we need to remember as we read um, any passage in the Bible is that that passage is part of a book in the Bible. And that book in the Bible is one of the 66 books that makes up the entire Bible. And so no passage, even though you could definitely pull out the meaning on its own and there is an intended purpose and meaning behind that passage, we always have to remember that no passage stands alone, meaning it's not ever apart from the entire Bible. And the entire Bible does have one overarching story. It has one big meta narrative. Um, and it's important for us to remember that story, that arc, that meta narrative when we read any of the passages that we study from the Bible. And so um, what, you know, general story arc of the Bible, we have creation, right? In Genesis one and two, we know this is um, the way that God intended the world to be. And so we have creation and, you know, it's not just what God intended, but it tells us a lot about who God is, um, who we are as his creation, uh, what the world is supposed to be and what our relationship with God is supposed to be. So there's a lot there that we learn. But we know in Genesis 3, we have the fall, right? That's kind of where the story starts progressing in this meta narrative. We know that sin into the world, that's a big, big, big problem for us. Sin into the world and we are in need of a solution um, to fix that sin problem. And then we have kind of most of the Bible, I would say a lot of the Old Testament too, has to do with redemption. And so given the fall, given the sin entering the world, um, the part of the story called redemption is really showing how God is unfolding his plan to save the world, to save mankind. Um, and then we have restoration, which is God making all things perfect with the return of Jesus. And so that's kind of the fourfold story arc of the Bible. And we always have to remember um, this big narrative as we read any of the passages. And so we, this is really important because if you look at it this way, this is one story, right? And any story has kind of a beginning, an end, like an introduction, a conclusion, uh, a building of the suspense, and there's always a climax to the story. Um, and so in our story, in the story of the Bible, I would say the climax is the coming, the ministry, the dying, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. All of the Bible is pointing to Jesus. Everything that happens before Jesus is pointing to the coming of Jesus, is looking forward to, it's anticipating Jesus. And everything that happens afterwards is just a reflection of his life and ministry and teaching, and it's... Um, and, and implications of what that means for us and how do we live as Christians and also what will happen when Jesus returns. And so you kind of see the whole Bible is pointing to and looking to Jesus. And that's really important for us as we read. Um, there's no book of the Bible that doesn't somehow um, take us back to Jesus Christ. And that's really, really important for us. And so looking for Christ, looking for how does this book of the Bible teach me and point me towards Christ? That's really important. And so remembering that every passage, every book of the Bible is part of a meta narrative, a part of one big story. We also have to remember the context um, because there, yes, it's one big story and every book of the Bible fits into that. But also remember that every book of the Bible is written by a particular author for a particular purpose, um, for a particular audience. There's certain styles they use and certain themes that each book carries. And so that will 
help us interpret various passages within that book, and it will help us to understand the book as it was intended to be understood, not necessarily how we want to uh, interpret it. Um, and so some of the questions that we need to ask are, who wrote the book? Um, to whom was it written? When was it written? In what literary style was it written? And what are some of the central themes in the book? And these are just kind of basic contextual questions for us to understand, um, you know, how do we make sense of this book in light of what the actual intended uh, purpose was? Um, and so how do we answer these questions? Well, the good thing is there are many, many smart people who have done all the research for us who have compiled this, who have looked into history um, and have put together a lot of resources for us. And so it's just a matter of us practice learning um, to read those resources, study those resources, and get the information we need. And so if you look in your um, binder, I just put an example of the introduction, the context that you can find from the book of Matthew in the ESV Study Bible and the NIV Study Bible. These are free available resources. You can easily find them on the web or you can find them in your Bibles. And so they're not hard to access and they're meant to be pretty reader friendly. And so um, these are there for us to read and it's supposed to help us. Um, if you've ever read through like a study Bible and you skip through the introduction of the book and you go straight into the book, um, next time try reading the intro first because it really does help us better understand the book. And so the next chart that I've provided in the handouts, um, it's just a chart that has the five questions that I asked. And I've just pulled together um, some of the answers, responses from um, the Matthew context that I put out for you. And so it's just a matter of taking a little bit of time to read those background information, the context, and being able to pull out the information we need. Um, and just you know, putting in a format like this is helpful, um, whatever works for you. But just so that we can better understand you know, why the book was written, who it was written for, and what are some of the things that we should watch out for, um, what are some of the big themes that maybe we should keep in mind as we read passages from this book. So if you remember the big narrative of the Bible, and then you know the context of the book in which you're reading from, um, now is the time to actually dive into the passage and study the passage. And so how should we do that? And I think sometimes it can be a little daunting for us to just kind of go through the passage and we don't really know how we're supposed to you know, study it. Um, and so I would just say these are kind of steps that have helped me and again, Everyone has something that works for them, um, but if you haven't found that yet, I think this is worth trying. So first, we should always start with praying. I think we have to always acknowledge that um, apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, there's nothing that we can get from the passage on our own. And we can't even believe that it's true on our own. It has to be the Holy Spirit living in us, softening our hearts, speaking to us, um, illuminating the truth to us. And so we have to ask. We pray. And, you know, I think we should pray bold prayers. We should pray, God, please speak to me clearly today through this passage. Show me something. Reveal more of yourself to me through this passage. After you've prayed, um, instead of trying to like go through and find details first, I would actually say read the whole passage first. Um, and so don't pick chunks that are too big. You know, and it will depend depending on if it's a letter or a narrative. But pick a reasonable sized passage and read the entire passage first, because you want to know kind of from beginning to end of that passage what is kind of the the big, you know, what either what's happening, what's the situation, or what's the context, or um, what's maybe the main point. And so you want to kind of think through the big picture of that passage first. So read through the entire passage in one sitting, and then go back and read it in more detail, and read it slowly, and remember the context. Okay, remember who wrote it, why, you know, is this a narrative, is this a letter, um, who is it written for? Remember that this story, um, this passage, is part of a bigger story in the Bible. Remember that all the Bible ultimately points us to Christ. And that remember that this passage is also, it fits into a particular place in that book. Say, for example, if we're reading Matthew 9, 18 to 16, I, have to, I should remember what happened in the verses before because that probably has to do with what's happening here. And so remember that there's also a flow to the book that you're reading. Um, and as you're reading in detail, I would say 
mark it up, highlight, circle, underline, write questions, you know, whatever sticks out to you, whatever is interesting to you, whatever is confusing to you, whatever you think might be important contextual clues in the passage, mark it up because you may never know how when you go back to those things, they may help you interpret. And when you um, mark up things that are confusing and you have questions, I would actually challenge you, instead of going to ask that question to someone or going to a book or a resource to answer that question, I would challenge you first, try answering that question on your own within the passage. Meaning, um, in, read your question, think of your question, and reread the passage and see, does this passage answer this question for me? If not, does the passage before or after maybe answer this question for me? And a lot of times I find that actually a lot of our questions, unless they're like technical questions about certain word or certain you know, grammatical things, I think a lot of our questions actually are answered within the context of the passage or the um, neighboring passages. And, but um, often we just kind of go quickly to resources to answer those questions for us. And so it's good habit and practice for us to try to um, think critically and to be able to answer those questions. And of course, sometimes we can't and that's okay. And that's why we have an abundance of resources. So after you've kind of done your study and you've looked through the passage in detail and you've done your markups, I would say um, next it's important for us to summarize. Um, I try to say summarize that passage, summarize the main point of that passage. And of course every passage will have many, many points, but there can be one main point. And so I would say summarize that main point in one or two sentences. Um, someone once said to me that, um, if you can't walk away from studying a passage with a tweetable in 140 characters or less um, summary of that passage, you might not actually understand what the passage is saying. And I actually think that's very true. If we can't condense in few words what the passage is trying to say to us, we might not have actually digested what the big point of that passage is. And so I think it's really important that we get in the habit of summarizing that passage. And also, I also think, um, it's helpful when we take the time to write out, and what does this passage teach me about God? Because I think often um, we read scripture and we study scripture solely for the point of application. And we're always looking for application. So we, we drive our reading by application. Um, and we look for personal applications like, what is it telling me to do? What is it telling me about myself? How should I change my life? And that's kind of how many of us read scripture. But we have to remember um, that some passages, yes, they may have direct applications, like someone may, like Paul may be saying, don't do this or do this. Um, but a lot of times we have to remember um, that the Bible, what the Bible tells us about God himself is an application for us because it affects how we view God, it affects how we view ourselves, and it, uh, view, it affects how we understand the world. What the scripture tells us about God himself, that should be good enough application for us because everything is about our relationship with God. And, and it puts us in a right place with God. And so um, when we read something and it doesn't really tell us commands, it doesn't tell us exactly explicitly what we should do. Um, sometimes you walk away thinking, oh, I didn't get anything out of this passage. There's no personal applications I'm walking away with. Well, even in a difficult passage like Leviticus or Numbers, when you're reading through all the you know, Old Testament um, laws, um, and cleansing the purity practices, you may walk away thinking, what does this have to do with me? Well, I think this passage is telling us that our God is a really holy God, that he requires this level of purity. And furthermore, that tells me, for me to have access to this God, it shows me a lot about what Jesus has accomplished in minimizing and closing the gap between me and a holy God like this. And so do you see, like, if we try to change the way that we think about uh, how we read scripture, it's not just all about you. It's actually all about God. Scripture points us to God himself. And so, um, yeah, don't stress yourself out with personal applications, but get in the habit of thinking, what is this passage teaching me about God? And then I would say close out with prayer. 
we start with prayer and we're going to end with prayer. And pray and thank God for what he has revealed to you. Uh, pray that it would sow good seeds in your heart. Um, pray that um, you will be able to live out what you have just read. Um, and sometimes we do go through difficult passages or kind of dry passages where we don't really feel much. Um, and that's okay. Don't base your time in scripture based on how you feel. Um, but thank God anyways for his living word and the fact that his word is good and is true and it is, um, it's good for us. It's food for our souls. And so thank God for that and end out your time in prayer. And so I think that those five steps are kind of the way that um, I would encourage you guys to try to uh, study through passages on your own. And I'm going to kind of quickly go through an example with you so you get a little bit better idea of what I'm talking about. And in your handouts, you should see, um, I printed out uh, Matthew 9, 18 to 26, and I've shown you kind of these are genuinely my own notes. When I went through this passage, these are the markups I made. These are the questions I made. And so... Remembering the context of Matthew, okay, um, Jesus has been born, he grew up, he's publicly baptized, and he began his public ministry. And so now he's at a point in Matthew chapter 9 where he's called the disciples, he's preached a famous sermon on the mount, and all throughout chapter 8 and 9, he's been performing miracles, okay? These are kind of the, the, cha the two chapters where a lot of miracles are happening. And we also remember Matthew has written the book of Matthew, uh, or the Gospel of Matthew primarily to a Jewish audience, okay? And that's from our context, and so we remember and we keep that in the back of our minds. And so as I'm reading, okay, while he was saying these things, okay, so while, and what is these things? I'm thinking these things have to be whatever preceded this passage. And so I know that in verse 17, Jesus was talking about new wineskins and wine, okay? So then, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him. Ruler? Um, what kind of ruler? Is this a Jewish ruler? Um, I'm thinking about the political climate that's happening all throughout the book of Matthew. Um, knelt before him. Okay, that's really significant. Why would a ruler come kneel before Christ? Especially if he's a Jewish leader. And I know this book is written to a Jewish audience, so that's going to stir something in them. Before him saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. She will live, not she may. How is he so sure? Why is he so sure? Um, that's really shocking to me. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. Okay, Jesus is following. And then, um, behold, a woman who has suffered from... A, okay, seems like we're entering kind of a, a different part of the passage, so I'm going to kind of mark that off. Behold, a woman who has suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years. Okay, I know that in Jewish culture, in Jewish law, blood discharge equals impurity. And I know that that means this woman is a social outcast. She's not allowed to participate in religious or social activities. And so in this, I know that the Jewish audience, they're going to pick up right away what it means for a woman to have discharged for 12 years. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. And she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Also, again, how is she, she so sure? What makes her so confident? That's really striking to me. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Okay, daughter, so personal and so affectionate. And I actually think I haven't seen him actually call anyone daughter up to this point in the book of Matthew. That's really significant. Your faith has made you well. That's also really striking to me. How does faith heal you bodily? And instantly, the woman was made well. Instantly. Not any delay in time. Okay. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and he saw the flute players, okay, question mark, flute players? <laughs> Why are there flute players when someone is dying? And the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. They laughed. And to me, that's really striking. That's when you compare that with the attitude of the ruler and the woman who were so confident in Jesus' abilities, I need to mark that. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and the girl arose. Also instantly. This happened instantly. And the report of this went through all that district. Okay. So these are kind of the markups that I had, some of the questions I had. Um, you know, some of them are kind of random, like the flute players. But... I couldn't answer that on my own, and so when I went and did a little bit of research, I found that oh, that's part of Jewish custom. And so some things I'm going to have to look out, but some things I can't answer here. 
Um, and so when I think about, okay, like why are they so sure? I think Jesus' words to the woman give us the answer. That your faith has made you well. These two people, the Jewish ruler and the woman, they're examples of those who have absolute faith in Jesus Christ. Um, and so this is kind of what I went through. And when I went through at the end to summarize, this is how I personally summarize the passage. I said, main points. Jesus has the power to heal the sick and resurrect the dead. And that seems kind of obvious, but we have to remember that the Gospels are being written to convince and to convey and to give confidence that Jesus really is the Messiah. And so it is important that people see through the passages in the gospel that Jesus has the power to heal the sick and resurrect the dead, that he is capable of that. So I do think that's a main point. I think another main point is faith and absolute trust in Jesus, in the person of Jesus Christ, is what saves. Um, and so Jesus, he saves us, and the means by which he saves us is through our faith. And so what does this teach me about God in light of redemption? the redemptive narrative, the big story. Um, I think this teaches me that this is just a preview, that God is capable of saving us from our sin, from, our, from death, um, and that Jesus will one day bring full healing and restoration. Um, and this is just a preview of, of kind of the, the big thing to come. And only those who have faith in the person of Jesus Christ are going to be able to participate in it. And so this is just, a, um, I'm seeing this as a small preview to what's going to happen later in the future. And so this teaches me a lot about God, that this is what, this is the kind of the mercy and the kindness and the power that God holds. And those who will um, experience it are those who have faith in Jesus. And so, um, you know, this is kind of an example, a quick example of a kind of how I would have taken this passage and some of the thoughts that I would have had. And of course, you know, I'm not showing you kind of the minutes of just me kind of sitting and wondering and pondering and then coming to these conclusions. And so um, I do hope this process is a little helpful for you. If anything, I hope this kind of shapes the way that you'll read certain passages and um, certain books of the Bible. Remember, um, always remember the context. Always remember that every passage is part of book, which is part of the big story of the Bible. And that ultimately, the whole Bible points us to Jesus. And so I hope this was helpful for you, and I hope this will be helpful, especially as we uh, enter our CCI class.